Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. When you make assumptions about how you and your partner will show up for each other in your relationship, that can ultimately erode the goodwill and generosity in your relationship. And on top of that, it can undermine your own ability to feel safe in your own skin. So this week, we're going to talk about how to make the implicit explicit so that the way that you and your partner collaborate in each other's lives actually adds energy to both of you instead of ultimately stealing your fire. It's an important topic, so get ready to dive deep. But first, are you finding Relationship Alive to be helpful in your life? If so, please consider a donation to help support what we do. To choose something that feels right for you, please visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And this week, I want to offer sincere gratitude to Danielle, Denise, Kelly, Kent, Abe, Sarah, Renee, Michaela, and Ruthanna. Thank you all so much for your generous contributions to help us keep the lights on here at Relationship Alive headquarters. This episode is also brought to you by Green Chef. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash alive. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them later in the show. So let's move on. When you first get into a relationship, it can feel almost magical the way that everything lines up. Those falling in love feelings often also lead to incredible generosity. We're inspired to show up for our beloveds for so many reasons, not the least of which being how good it feels to offer them something and then to see the, the happiness that comes as a result. Back in episode 102, Jeff Zeig talked about the phenomenon called topia, which stands for taking obvious pleasure in another's happiness, which is central to that falling in love feeling. And when this is happening, it can feel like you've been brought together in order to complement each other. Not just compliment like, hey, honey, you look good today, but to actually compliment each other to, to create a whole where uh, before there were simply parts and to make each other's lives easier. And what's the point of being in relationship if not to share joy and make each other's lives easier? Otherwise, why would we tolerate all of those challenges that take place in relationship? So I'm not going to get down on the way that that happens, that whole falling in love process and showing up for each other with incredible generosity. On the other hand, what tends to happen is that the overwhelming generosity that marks the beginning of a relationship leads to ways that we can take each other for granted. And this is a huge double-edged sword that can slice right into your happiness together and take you down if you are not careful. So let me explain a little bit more. Why is it a double-edged sword? Why not just a single-edged sword or just a blunt club or something like that? Because on the one side of the blade are the assumptions that we start making about our partner. Assumptions about how they will take care of us, show up for us, make life happier and easier, etc. The problem isn't that they're doing all of these things, because that they're doing it and hopefully feeling great about it is amazing. The problem is the assumption, the expectations that can then lead to creating resentment. In the ways where you once showed up willingly... Uh, out of generosity, you might now find yourself feeling like you're being taken for granted and wondering if your partner really gets how much you do for them. So this is the side of you showing up being incredibly generous and that evolving into you being on the receiving end of your partner's expectations and assumptions. 
So don't worry, in a moment, I'm gonna give you a way to steer clear of this problem and how to, how to navigate your way out of it anyway, if it's already happening. But you might remember that a moment ago, I said that this is a double-edged sword. So what's the other problem in this whole situation? The other side of the blade is the way in which we learn to rely on our partner and how that can sometimes get in the way of our being able to even realize our own capabilities. It's in a way a form of learned helplessness, not the kind that links, that's linked to trauma or recurring pain, though of course that can also happen in relationships. I'm talking about how we come to rely on our partners and then when they for some reason can't show up in the way that we've come to rely on them, it actually triggers our fear instead of inspiring us to be capable. So here's an example. Um, these are the kinds of things that you come to see more clearly when you have to be apart from your partner for any length of time. As you start to realize all the ways that they contribute to your life or the household or to your well-being. Like imagine that your partner leaves for a week and you suddenly realize that there are no groceries in the fridge or gas in the car or dinner on the table when you get home from work. I'm talking about mundane things, but these kinds of things can transpire in any category. It can be the affection that you suddenly realize you're not getting, etc. Sometimes when that happens, instead of diving into our own capability, like going to the grocery store or gassing up the car and cooking a nice dinner or even figuring out how to show up for ourselves in our loneliness and doing all of those things ourselves, we can go into a fear response from not being taken care of in the ways that we're used to. So there we are in our trigger, not only not getting our needs met, but also feeling fight, flight, or freeze in reaction to a partner who simply went out of town on business or for whatever reason. And that can also lead to resentment, right? We can resent our partners for leaving us to fend for ourselves, or we can resent them for making us confront our own little ways of being helpless, or we can actually resent ourselves for having given so much power away to our partners in the first place. It's a habit that we acquire, letting our partners do things for us and coming to rely on them for that. Um, quick side note on that, which is that often, once you've moved through that triggered place, you can find an enormous blessing in having that space, that time apart, so that you can feel not only what it's like to miss your partner, hopefully, but also you can feel what you're truly capable of and start showing up for yourself in ways that you've abdicated to your partner. It's super powerful to have that experience. So what's ironic about this situation is that it's usually true for both partners. In other words, it's rare that one of you is doing all the assuming and the other one of you is doing all the work. The reality is that usually both of you give in your own ways and both of you can feel taken for granted. This is a dynamic that we actually talked about back in our episode with Betty Martin, episode 162, where we talked about the wheel of consent. And in that episode, we were talking about how consent or like what we're agreeing to in terms of any exchange we're talking about how it impacts the way that we touch or receive touch from our partners but the underlying premise is the same as you come to understand the dynamics of giving and receiving um, but i'll let you listen to that episode 162 to get that part of what i'm talking about what we're focused on here is the danger that making assumptions brings to your relationship and I'm going to show you what to do about it. We'll solve all your assumption problems uh, with just a simple exercise or two, or maybe three, in just a moment. However, this is the time in the show when I get to tell you about this week's sponsors. And they both have cool deals for you. So you can try them out at a discount and experience what they're cooking up for you. 
And this week's first sponsor, Green Chef, is literally cooking things up for you. Well, actually, they're preparing and you do the cooking. Their food is amazing. Chloe and I sampled their paleo menu because that tends to be how we eat and not only had three incredibly yummy, sustainably sourced meals, but we had a really good time cooking together. It's awesome to have most of the prep work done for you. So all you have to do is follow their step-by-step instructions and voila, you have high quality meals that everyone, and I mean everyone in our house, even the kids who tend to be kind of picky, they really enjoyed the food. I think my favorite probably was the Montreal spiced shaved steak hash, Um, but Chloe really liked the chicken tinga, which had this amazing cashew crema sauce that totally brought out the tangy taste of the lime juice we had just sprinkled over the top. And this was, of course, all stuff that they had supplied for us. Anyway, it's an exceptional way to add new ideas to your weekly menu. And I don't know about you, but in our household, you can kind of get into a rut fairly easily about what you're cooking week after week. So important to note, Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company. And each week they send you a wide variety of organic ingredients and imaginative tasty recipes handpicked and delivered right to your door. Their meal plans include paleo, vegan, vegetarian, keto, gluten-free, omnivore, and carnivore. And their expert chefs design recipes with gourmet flavor and the pre-made sauces, dressings, and spice mixtures they send right along to help you get more flavor without having to actually spend time preparing all of those sauces and dressings and spice mixtures. As I mentioned, they have a special offer for you as a Relationship Alive listener. For $50 off your first box of Green Chef, go to greenchef.us slash alive. That's $50 off your first box if you go to greenchef.us slash alive. And thank you, Green Chef, for supporting thriving, healthy, sustainable, organic relationships. Our next sponsor is Babbel, the number one selling language learning app in the world. And if you've heard me talk about them already on the show, then you should know that they're now sweetening their offer for you, different from what I've talked about already. First, you can learn Spanish, French, Italian, Russian, Swedish, Danish, and they have more choices. My son and I decided that we were going to learn a language together, and we picked one of the romance languages, of course, Italian. Using Babbel, you can be speaking your new language within weeks, and you'll be ready for practical situations like meeting new people, ordering food, asking for directions, and other things that matter when you're trying to communicate. So far, I've found that their approach is working really well for me as I not only learn new words, but I get to review things as I go, which is helping me remember what I'm learning. So how's it going so far? I would say... Tutto bene. Although I have to admit that I like saying non c'è male better for some reason, which means not that bad. To learn a language you've always wanted to learn, go to babbel.com and use the offer code ALIVE to get 50% off your first three months. That's babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com and use the offer code ALIVE for 50% off your first three months with them. And Babel, grazie mille for supporting Relationship Alive. So now let's get back into the conversation about how to keep your assumptions from eroding your relationship. As I hinted at the very beginning, the antidote to the toxic effect of assuming on your relationship is to make the implicit explicit. In other words, to get really clear on the dynamic that's happening in your relationship and to turn assumptions, so those things that you aren't that you don't talk about and don't speak about, to turn those into agreements, things you've actually talked about with your partner and come to agree to. You may have heard me talk about agreements before on Relationship Alive as they're a key part of creating the container of your relationship. 
So far, we've talked about them more in broad strokes, though. Um, They represent the things that you and your partner agree not to do. But things like, uh, you know, spending large sums of money without talking to each other about it first, or perhaps your agreements around monogamy. These things are important to be really clear about with your partner. Again, you're making the implicit explicit. We've also talked about the things that you agree to do, things like um, being committed to supporting each other's growth or sharing appreciations with each other each night. Those are just a couple small examples, but they can be larger as well. The problem with assumptions is that they actually represent agreements that you haven't agreed to. They have the same degree of expectations often that come with an actual agreement, but the problem is that you and your partner don't actually know exactly that the agreement exists. So let me give you another example. Let's say that every night your beloved gets home from work 30 minutes earlier than you do. And every night they get home, take the dog out, and then start cooking dinner. So you walk in the door and the dog comes over to you, tail wagging, and you fall on the floor to give your dog a tummy rub while your partner is there standing over the stove whipping up something tasty. Only instead of being really happy to see you, for some reason your partner is standing there over the stove looking really serious as they saute the onions. And you already have that sinking feeling that there's something going on that you're going to have to talk about later. Now, let's just state the obvious here. You should always greet your partner before you start rubbing your dog's belly. If your dog is getting more affection and attention than your partner is, then you are bound for trouble. Trust me. In fact, maybe I'll even devote an episode to just that at some point in the future, uh, the doggy dynamics in relationship. Um, But for now, I'm just going to move right along and let's take this situation a step further. Now, let's imagine that it's this way night after night, except one night you get home and your partner is in the living room, kicking back, reading a book. And as you walk in the door and the dog rushes over to greet you, they say something like, great, you're home. Can you take the dog out? And then you realize that they've already cooked and eaten an early dinner without you, and maybe even without leaving any leftovers for you. In that moment, are you feeling maybe just a little bit resentful? I'm pretty sure that the answer here would be yes. And why is that? Why was your partner stewing over something when you came home to their cooking? And why are you now stewing? Because it's suddenly on you to take the dog out and figure out dinner. I mean, if it was your dog, then perhaps before you and your partner got together, you took your dog out all the time and made your own dinner all the time. And I'm sure that on some level, your partner at one point was cooking dinner for you happily, willingly, generously. So why have things suddenly changed? Now, in this hypothetical situation that I know you have definitely never experienced, um, did you and your partner ever create an actual agreement about who was going to take the dog out and start dinner? Now, of course, it's possible that you did at some point create an agreement, but now that agreement might be stale something that you made long ago and which is no longer working for one or for both of you. It's worth revisiting your agreements every so often. And if any agreement isn't working for one of you, then it's not working for both of you. But in order to revisit your agreements, you're going to have to know what your agreements are. So let's get there together. As you may be guessing right now, you are going to actually have to communicate with your partner to figure this out. But before you take that step, let's get more clear on what your assumptions even are. The best way to do this is to keep track. 
So um, have you ever used like a time tracking app to figure out how you spend your time when you're on your computer? It, you know, keeps track of each app that you do. And if you're on the web, what websites you visit, things like that. That can be really useful data to have so that after a week or two, you get to see when and how you're the most productive and correspondingly when and how you totally waste time. It's useful and occasionally it's kind of scary too. So for the next week, I'd like you to do something similar. I'd like you to keep track of all the ways in which you are relying on your partner. The challenge is going to be remembering to do this throughout your day. So one way to approach it is to have a little pocket notebook that you carry with you so that you can note things down as they happen. Or you can, of course, keep track in your smartphone. The key here is first to remember to be paying attention throughout your day so that you actually are aware of all the ways that you're relying on your partner. And then to actually write them down or to note it. Now it's tempting here to think, okay, I'm just going to notice it as it happens and to take the little shortcut and not write anything down or actually keep track of anything. So unless you have a superhuman memory, do not do this. Write it down or record it somehow. This is important first so that you don't miss anything and second so that as you review your notes at the end of the week, you'll have a sense of just how vast the number of assumptions are and it will be easy to miss or forget the details for most of us, again, unless you are blessed with an amazing memory and the ability to pull it all out at the end of a week or two. Um, now, there may be some things that jump out at you right away as you hear me talking about this, and you can go ahead and write those things down or record those things now. Maybe it's the who makes the meal scenario. Maybe it's who does the laundry or the grocery shopping or who initiates sex. Maybe it's that you trust your partner to text you back within five minutes when you've texted them. And if any more times time goes by, you start to get anxious or something like that. The big question here is, what are all the ways that I rely on my partner? And of course, you also want to keep track of what are all the ways that they're relying on me. Again, take time, take a week, at least the next week, and keep track of all of those things in a notebook so that you can revisit it later. And after a week of that goes by, you get to look over your findings. Now, there will probably be some things on your list that you already knew about, and, and hopefully there will also be some surprises on your list. See if you can get a sense of what led to a particular thing becoming just a way of being. How did it work its way onto your assumption list? That's helpful to know. At a, at a 1,000 foot view, you can often see the ways that these patterns started, which is a great way of seeing your own part in things. And again, many, or if not most of these things, probably started when you were being really, really generous with each other. And the idea here is not to not be generous. It's just to get really clear on the things that have become not about generosity and instead have become about your assumptions. So now the next step is going to be to communicate with your partner about what you've discovered. And I'm gonna give you a framework for having that conversation in just a moment. As you might expect, the way that you talk about it will have a huge impact. For some important pointers, make sure that you check out my free relationship communication guide. If you've already downloaded it, then you might wanna revisit it just for a reminder of the points that I talk about. And if you haven't gotten it yet, what are you waiting for? It's free and you can grab it at neilsatin.com slash relate or by texting the word relate to the number 33444 and following the instructions. So, okay, let's talk about how to approach this conversation with your partner. 
maybe you're lucky and you're already listening to Relationship Alive together and doing this research together. So if that's the case, then you simply want to schedule a time to talk about what you discovered. If you're doing this on your own, then the first step is to ask your beloved if there's a time when you can sit down to talk about some important things you've been noticing. Don't just spring this on your partner. And even if you have a long list of ways that your partner is making assumptions about you, I would not bring that up just yet. If your partner asks you what you wanna talk about, just say that you've been noticing some ways that you take them for granted. And you were hoping to be able to sit down, chat with them and get some clarity about it. Maybe even express your gratitude for the specific things, the specific ways you've been taking them for granted. So that kind of thing. You, you can hopefully get the sense that what you're trying to do is put a positive spin on it and to take total responsibility for the conversation. So you don't want them to think that this is at all about you pointing the finger at them for something or blaming them. When the appointed time arrives, then... Yes, you want to set the stage by talking about how you've noticed all these ways in which you've been relying on your partner or taking them for granted or making assumptions that things are a certain way. And if you have lots of examples to choose from in your observations, you might choose one that seems the least triggering to your partner. In other words, start with something easy, uh, not necessarily a hot button issue first thing. Then you might say something like, um, like I've been operating as if this is an agreement that we've made to do things this way, but we never really did make that agreement, did we? Or maybe we did, but that was a long time ago, and I'm not sure that it necessarily makes sense anymore. What do you think? Each step along the way, you want to check in with your partner to see if what you're saying is making sense to them. Do they get it, what you're saying? Do they agree? Can they lend any insight into what you've already noticed? If you're starting with ways that you've been taking them for granted, then it will be easier to inspire their collaboration in the conversation. One thing to pay attention to here is your own level of activation, of being triggered. If your partner is too eager to point out the assumptions that you've been making, then you could find yourself feeling like you're being attacked. So do your best here to find your balance on your own to take responsibility for your emotional state. As much as possible, you want to keep operating from your prefrontal cortex. In other words, the non-triggered part of your brain that knows how to problem solve, how to stay curious, and how to be creative. So what's the ultimate goal here? The goal is to bring up the assumptions that you've been making and then to ask your partner if there's an agreement that you can actually make together about each particular thing. It's really as simple as that. Some possible ways to frame that might include something like, in this situation, would you like to, and then you insert the thing that you're agreeing about, or you might ask, uh, what would make that okay for you? What would make that feel like something you actually want to do? Or um, how, can I, how can I help you so that you're not doing it on your own? Or let's see, or how about this? What would be a meaningful way to you that I could show my appreciation? because we're often showing our appreciation in ways that are meaningful for us, but not necessarily meaningful for our partners. So getting really clear on that might be helpful. Or um, you might ask, is there some way that I could contribute that would make a difference to you so that you're sharing, sharing the load in some way? 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, you may also discover that some of these ways that you've come to rely on your partner actually are obstacles to your own feeling of being fulfilled, actualized, and, and capable in your own life. So rather than your go-to being trying to get your partner's buy-in to just keep doing things that way, but with agreement, I invite you to first consider how you can show up to at least be an equal partner in what's happening. And this is what the agreement process can be about. If something really is a trade, like you're going to do all the grocery shopping and cooking and I'm going to do all the cleanup and pay the bills, for instance, that's a very traditional way that some families have have done this, um, then at least it's explicit and something that you've agreed to. But you might consider taking full responsibility for making this thing happen for you rather than relying on your partner at all. What would that be like? Because it could be about your reclaiming that part of yourself. Or it could also be a way of discovering ways to give even more to the relationship. I leave it to you to feel through this situation for what feels best to you and your partner. Because as much as possible, I want you both to be collaborating, but definitely spend time entertaining the different possibilities instead of immediately rushing to the first solution that jumps out at you or agreeing to how things have been this whole time. Bear in mind, too, that even if your partner says that they are more than happy to do whatever it is that they've been doing, by at least getting it out in the open, you can ensure that you're both completely in integrity about it. And you can also discuss how to safely bring it up with each other if the agreement stops being okay with either one of you. Having a way to bring the topic up without anyone getting triggered or resentful, in other words, revisiting your agreements on a regular basis and having that be just built into the structure of your relationship will help you keep things healthy and minimize resentment in the time ahead. You definitely, if you start feeling resentment, as long as you're revisiting your agreements regularly, you'll have a chance to talk about it before that resentment builds up. By the way, in case you were wondering about how to address all those ways that you feel like your partner might be taking you for granted, again, remember that it's best to start with an offering, which in this case is you taking responsibility for all the assumptions that you've been making. Now, next, you might, for one thing, um, you might share with your partner the process that you've been going through. And you could ask them if they would be willing to do something similar, to spend a week um, looking at the ways that they might be taking you for granted, um, because they may come up with ways that you don't even realize. Or you might just ask them, if you want to go through your list right there, um, you might just ask them, would you be willing to talk about some other places where I think we could use a more explicit agreement between us? And if the answer is yes, then you're on the right track. So instead of framing this part of the conversation as ways that you are being taken for granted, you might instead say something like, here's a place where our agreement isn't quite clear. And notice how that's different. Because if you say you're taking me for granted in this particular situation, then just saying that is an accusation and it's going to put your, your partner on the defensive. It's different if you're taking responsibility. If you're saying I'm, I'm the one who's been taking you for granted, then there's, there's no attack there. But as soon as you tell your partner that they're taking you for granted, then the chances are pretty good that unless they're very tuned in and relaxed, they will probably get defensive. So the way around that is to keep it neutral. So as I said, here is a place where our agreement isn't quite clear. 
And then rather than focusing on the assumption, in other words, rather than saying something like, it seems like you assume I'm going to make dinner every night. You might say something like, I find that most nights I'm the one who's making dinner and I'm doing it all by myself. And while I do enjoy making dinner, what I really miss is the opportunity for us to work together to make choices about what we're going to eat. So I'm just making this up here, but I find lately that that I've been getting lonely and, and maybe even a little sad instead of feeling inspired when I cook for both of us. So would you be willing to talk about ways that we could change that up a bit and get onto the same page, be on the same team, collaborate? Can we talk about it? Now, you might be surprised that if you present it in this way where you're just talking about the situation and owning your feelings rather than putting anything on your partner, that they might actually show up with some really creative solutions, especially if they're not feeling blamed. And they may even surprise you with being willing to show up in a way that you had thought that maybe they were incapable of or unwilling to do, and they really might surprise you, especially when not only are they not being blamed, but you've also made the gesture of showing them all of these ways that you've noticed that they show up for you, the earlier part of the conversation where you were sharing with them your assumptions. Does that all make sense? It's a lot. It's a lot to do. And yet there are huge rewards for going through this process. And in some ways, it's a constant process because we're always capable of making assumptions about what our partner is or isn't going to do. So if you find yourself in a mode where you're feeling disappointed or sad or angry about something, it's always best to think about, oh, is there something going on here that I thought we had agreed to, but in fact, we didn't. We never made the implicit explicit. And that is my invitation to you for the coming week. Okay, I think that that is enough to get you going in the right direction. If you are on Facebook and haven't joined us yet in the Relationship Alive community, please come find us there. You can get support from the more than 2,300 Relationship Alive listeners who are creating a safe space to talk about relationships. Um, by the way, you can also find me on Instagram. Just make sure you follow the Relationship Alive official account. And in the meantime, if you know someone who might benefit from hearing this episode, please feel free to send the link along to them. It's neilsatin.com slash 167 for episode 167. I look forward to being with you next week. I'm still not totally sure who we're going to hear from. I have some really good potential choices for you. So I'm sitting with that today. And in the meantime, take care. And I will see you soon. Mm -hmm.